Before I get into this review proper, I want to mention that recently this YouTube channel passed the 100,000 subscriber milestone. So I want to say thank you to everyone who has subscribed or followed the channel over these years. Your support has meant so much to me, the way you all motivate me and challenge me to do better. Thanks for taking this YouTube journey with me, you are all the absolute best. Now I wasn't sure what to do for this milestone, because I am terrible at planning and would feel self-conscious about doing a milestone special, so instead, let's just look at an episode that is nostalgic and fun. So without further ado... Homer at the Bat is one of my favorite Simpsons episodes ever. It's like top five easily for me. It's so good. And this is coming from me, who doesn't even follow baseball. It's that good. But compared to other top tier Simpsons, what I find especially fascinating about Homer at the Bat is the way the story evolves over its three acts. This is a plot that zigzags all over the place, even more than by Simpsons standards, introducing so many seemingly disparate elements. As a result, each act of the story feels extremely distinct. Act 1 feels totally different than Act 2, which feels totally different than Act 3. Honestly, it's kind of a ridiculous miracle that the whole thing comes together in the end. So today, instead of looking at the episode in a more general overview sense, let's break it down chronologically, one act at a time. Each act is distinct and lovely in its own way, and they each deserve their moment in the sun. This is Homer at the Bat, a wonderfully chaotic masterpiece in three acts. One of my absolute favorite things about Homer at the Bat is how ordinary it starts out. You know, a very simple story about Homer joining the softball team, creating a so-called magic bat, and after that, it's just us watching them play softball for a while. There's not much to it. Throw in some power plant banter, Marge being adorable, Lenny a psychopath, and you've got the quintessential Act 1 of Season 3. It's extremely easygoing and quaint. Even with the introduction of Wonder Bat, the show doesn't go into much detail about what's really going on here. It just tacitly accepts that Homer made this bat, and now he's this home run hitting dynamo. We the audience could surmise that maybe Wonder Bat is indeed magic, or if it's illegal in some way, or whether there's a placebo that's affecting Homer. The why isn't the important part here. It reminds me a little of Bart Sells' Soul in this regard, where the episode leaves it open-ended regarding these specific details. I think this is really effective though in adding that important layer of romanticism to the story. All throughout, they're throwing at us baseball homages to The Natural and Pride of the Yankees and stuff, and aside from some cute little jokes, mostly at Homer's expense, they play this parody straight. It taps into that magical nature of sports, that somehow this little ragtag team of misfits could make it all the way to the championship. We know the story archetype intimately by now, we've seen them so many times. Normally, these kind of sports plots require these challenges and obstacles throughout the season, but Homer at the Bat completely bypasses all of them in Act 1. The important thing is to give us the general impression of a classic sports story. It's all about vibe. Now obviously, we all know where this is going. This earnestness is not going to last. But I think if you're going to do this kind of bait and switch plot structure, then you have to make Act 1 extremely convincing. I think using the romanticism of baseball to obscure the trap you're setting is such a genius idea. We can faithfully celebrate the genre while leading the audience down the garden path. They don't even tease us with a big cliffhanger at the act break. Sure, we get a sense of our first major complication, but you don't know what Mr. Burns will actually do. Act 1 remains pure and innocent to the very end. Wait a minute, what's this? Now this episode is a wacky Mr. Burns romp? Did I miss something during the commercial break? I love how they execute this shift between Acts 1 and 2, how abruptly and dramatically it moves in a different direction. It's almost as if Mr. Burns was watching the episode with us, decided, nah, we're not gonna do that, and then rewrote a starring vehicle for himself and some celebrities. It's not even like the later star-studded affairs like Krusty Gets Cancelled or Homer Palooza, where the build-up to the celebrities is a logical extension of the story. It's just, nope, now we're doing short vignettes with Mike Sosha, Ozzy Smith, and Don Mattingly. Y'all cool with that? Okay. I always wonder if this exact same plot structure would have gone over as well if it were produced in season 30 instead of season 3. That we'd be like, 
why did they waste a perfectly good plot by bringing in these celebrities? And then we go at Al Jean on Twitter about it incessantly. In Homer at the Bat, I think they get away with this shift because of how low stakes and shallow the story is thus far. From a character perspective, this isn't about Homer overcoming a deep-seated sense of failure. It's not like the team has struggled through so much adversity that it's a huge bummer to take this away from them. No, this has been a fun and frivolous affair. Nothing more, nothing less. It's not like something like Tennis the Menace either, where the celebrities take over at the very end and you wonder how the hell this is a culmination of anything. We've still got a whole act to circle back around to Homer. In addition, Mr. Burns hijacking the plot makes a lot of sense, given his character. There's that extra layer of the class divide between management and employees, that a manager could step in at any time and arbitrarily decide to shift resources or micromanage everyone, even if the project was successful already. Plus, Mr. Burns doesn't even know who Homer Simpson is. Of course he would take his plot away from him without even thinking about it. Honestly, this is probably my favorite Mr. Burns portrayal ever. He's just so assertively delusional. We get so many wonderful old-timey jokes here, from dead baseball players to old-fashioned strength and conditioning regimens. He sets up several jokes that will pay off beautifully in Act 3. I talked about the romanticism of baseball stories in Act 1, so this old-timey perspective is well suited to this concept. Mr. Burns came into this episode late, but he is thoroughly convinced that he is the hero of this adventure. The baseballers are such blank slates in the context of the Simpsons world that the writers are free to do whatever they want with them. There aren't many restrictions or actual plot points in Act 2 either. So they emphasize having as much fun as possible with these guys. Let's do some Smithers jokes. Now some Mr. Burns stuff. Now some jokes with our other regulars. Set up Homer's rivalry with Daryl Strawberry. I will admit that the pacing can be a little weird during Act 2. Like they'll set up this gym scene with a music cue, suddenly cut to a quick Burns gag, and then go somewhere else with a different music cue. All of these jokes definitely work, but the sequencing and rhythm can feel odd in places. They do pay lip service to Homer's character journey by including this dining room scene in the middle of Act 2. I think this is a pretty important scene in creating a sort of through line in this chaotic story. The plot has shifted in an improbable way, and Homer is being very honest with the audience about where things are heading and the challenges he's facing. He knows it's over, the audience should too. Even when the episode teases Homer, in the back of our minds, we already know it's not happening for him. There's a level of honesty to Homer at the Bat that you wouldn't expect in this kind of episode. That the story is going to go all over the place, but it's going to warn the audience in advance. Once it has picked a direction, it's not going to deviate from it. It creates a subtle atmosphere of inevitability that pays off in spades during Act 3. The more times I've watched Homer at the Bat, the more convinced I am that this is the most important scene in the episode. That right here, right at the opening of Act 3, Mr. Burns very clearly telegraphs to the audience what's about to happen. I think there are versions of this episode where I'd roll my eyes at this approach, where it comes off as lazy self-consciousness to cover up questionable plot decisions, but I think with the zigzaggy tendencies of the plot, the episode desperately needs a scene like this. Without it, we have a story where these baseballers hijack everything temporarily in Act 2, and then just arbitrarily go away in Act 3, making the whole thing feel like filler content. This way, it feels more deliberate. That Mr. Burns originally brought in these characters in Act 2, so Mr. Burns will be the one to tempt fate during Act 3. To be clear, Mr. Burns obviously doesn't want these misfortunes to happen, and doesn't directly cause all of them, but given how much agency he has in the story, we need him to set the stage. Mr. Burns continues as the writer and director of the adventure. The individual misfortunes are extremely well paced, and connect up well with what came before. Some of it was set up during the training montage, some of it during the initial Smithers meetup, they don't stick to one formula. I love Mike Sosha's arc in particular. The blue collar theme is well represented, and he delivers such a hilarious vocal performance in the end. That song was right. Mike Sosha's tragic illness made us smile. I appreciate how gradually they reveal these misfortunes. That it's not this super long montage of eight of them before the big game. Instead, it keeps the story moving along, and we can knock out Roger Clemens, Don Mattingly, and Daryl Strawberry later. I feel like Wade Boggs gets the short end of the stick in terms of overall screen time, but he more than makes up for it with his memorable exit. Pit the Elder. We all know that Don Mattingly is the best though. Him and those distracting, distracting sideburns. 
even more than the nerve tonic and the hypnotist, he is just the perfect target for Mr. Burns' delusional overconfidence. The animators did a great job with his facial expressions. Love his sense of bewilderment. Honestly, I think he gets the best intro scene too. It's ironic that in real life, he wasn't that enthused about being the homebody doing dishes because it's so damn funny. Such a great comedic foil. The tricky thing about this kind of self-destructive story is that a satisfying ending is harder to nail down. The celebrities in Act 2 tore down Homer's Wonder Bat story, then Act 3 tore down the celebrities. There's nothing left standing. The instinct might be that we revert back to Homer's success story, proving everyone else wrong, but it's hard to go back to that after all this insanity. Homer hitting the walk-off home run is just an extension of Act 1, making Act 2 feel like filler content again. I think having Homer get whacked in the head with a ball is a nice solution here. Not only is it hilarious, but it gives him his crowning achievement in an offbeat, unexpected way. It's a good culmination for Mr. Burns, too, that his delusion and overbearing coaching style ends up being the final misfortune for Daryl Strawberry. After seeing a bunch of random misfortunes, it's nice that they finish them off with something character-driven. By the way, I love this exchange between these two. Mr. Burns' explanation about playing the percentages lives rent-free in my head. What a logically sound argument that completely misses the point. And of course, that ending song is like the greatest thing ever. Such a relaxing tune, such easygoing vocals, such joyous and horrific lyrics. Always makes me smile. In the wise words of Mike Reese, it's amazing how you can feel instantly nostalgic for something you just watched. Obviously, you can tell from the approach that I took with this review that I am totally enamored with the way that Homer at the Bat came together. It's full of elements that I often write off in other episodes, and is about a sport that I don't really follow, but I am just so captivated by it. When I got my Season 3 DVD box set many Christmases ago, this was the episode that I used to come back to repeatedly, sometimes with commentary on, sometimes just to listen to that song. I love it for a lot of the same reasons I love a film like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Obviously, the two share common plot elements with the inevitable misfortunes, how Ozzie Smith falls into a chocolate river, and Ken Griffey Jr. turns into a blueberry or something. I guess Roger Clemens is the golden goose. I don't know. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison. But I think both of them do such an interesting job balancing the cynical darkness of some of the plot elements with the magic and wonder of the setting and genre. You bring in the audience with a generally straightforward Act 1, set up a simple character journey for a protagonist, and then it's off to Cuckoo Bananas Land with a quirky entrepreneur. At least Homer at the Bat doesn't have a terrifying boat ride in it. I think the simplified answer is that when you have jokes that are consistently this good, this memorable and iconic, that they'll smooth over any of the weird plot stuff. And I suppose to some degree, this is true. If Act 2 didn't consist entirely of comedy bangers, maybe this plot shift would come off as arbitrary and pointless. But I think there were a lot of incredibly intelligent little decisions made throughout the story that raises it above just being a simple gag fest. I had once described Homer at the Bat as being foreshadowing to sillier affairs like Last Exit to Springfield or celebrity-laden episodes like Krusty Gets Cancelled, but the fact that this was produced in Down to Earth Season 3, where it has one foot still in the old school vibe, gives it a flavor that is unmatched in Simpsons history. There's a warmth to Homer at the Bat that puts it in a league of its own, one of the all-time great Simpsons episodes. How can you not be romantic about Homer at the Bat? <laughs>